But we just talked about last week about knowledge is power. Knowledge is power. And when you get, oh, there you go. Knowledge is power. And I'm telling you, in everything, knowledge is power. If you don't know, you don't get the benefit of it. That's why we're so strong in this church about education, about, about educating yourself in the things of God and in all things. Edu- you know, I, uh, the older I get, the more I love to study. The more I love to learn about biology and chemistry, the more I love to learn about economics, you know, because even when it comes to your financial blessing, you do tithe and give offerings, but what that does is open up your heart and your mind to understand how finances work and to make, to, for you to be prosperous, you need to get knowledge. You need to get knowledge of how the economic system works and you need to work it. And so knowledge is power, and when it comes to health, when it comes to wealth, when it comes to joy, when it comes to peace, knowledge is power. If you don't get knowledge, you will lack power. And the Bible says that those who lack knowledge actually, uh, you know, will, will die. Do you know one of the first studies they did, you know, you hear all these studies all the time? You all read all the studies? You know, sometimes you get a little tired of all the studies, you know? Because a lot of times, you know, if I hit you and it hurts, you don't need a study uh, of several people hitting people to find out if it hurts. You just know it hurts. But at the same time, studies were there to help persuade people and give firm evidence so that people can make, make decisions. And one of the first studies was over, well, over one of my favorite topics. is over scurvy. You all know what scurvy is? What is scurvy? Okay, it's a disease. It comes from lack of vitamin C. What does it do? Deb? <laughs> Diarrhea? Actually, you start bleeding out of, uh, out of the, uh, all over. You start bleeding. Breaks down the cellular structure and you start bleeding. And, uh, and it would kill a lot of people. It would kill a lot of sailors. And so one of the very first studies was only done with 12 people. And, you know, if, if, if you get dramatic exalts, you only need a few on a study. If you, get loud, if you get minimal results, you need thousands of people to be involved in the study. When they do a drug study now, they put thousands of people into it because the, the, the results are so minute that they have to really look at a lot of them. But with, the, with this first study, there, I think there's only 12 of them. And so, uh, you know, um, let's see. Well, there's either three or four, obviously. I think it was three groups of four. And they uh, left one that, you know, that got everything the way it was, and another got something, and then the other ones got, uh, uh, got lemons and, and uh, oranges or whatever else. And... They didn't need any more than that because the results were so dramatic. Those that got vitamin C from the lemons and stuff instantly started getting healed. And those that did, you know, how'd you like to be in that group that didn't get no- nothing, you know? I mean, and find out that the other guys got healed and, you know, I don't know. When you volunteer for a study, be very careful uh, what study you're volunteering for because somebody's going to be a loser in the study or the study's no good. So just remember that if you ever volunteer to be in a study. Knowledge is power. Next one. Knowledge is relationship and experience. We're not just talking about knowing something in your head. A lot of people have a lot of head knowledge about a lot of things. It doesn't do them any good. Until they put it to use, till they practice it, till they're doers of it, till they're, you know, in, uh, in relationship and in experience. So uh, experience life. I, I, you know, one of my little uh, themes in life is, is why... Why so many people just, I mean, we all have fear about stepping across the line and doing something, but why are so many people have so much fear that they can't do anything in life? Because then it's not a, a question of what's going to happen to you. You know what's going to happen to you. You're not going to get to experience life. You know, a lot of people are afraid of doing something. I remember my grandfather was 100 years old when he was looking up at a piece of tin on a tin roof saying it was blowing up there, the nails had loosened up, and he said, somebody ought to go up there and nail that down. But he said, I'm afraid about going up there myself. I may fall and hurt myself for life. And he was 100 years old. But for the most part, my grandfather, at 100 years old, was on top of his cedar roof uh, 
shingles raking, raking the leaves off and still taking chances. And, and I remember my aunt said, we can't let him do that. And I said, you know, I made a decision there as a teenage boy. Life was meant to be lived right up to the last. My dad is 90 years old now, and uh, we were redoing our dam. Our dam, you know, just a little pond out by our place. Have you ever seen it? It gets water in it, and it kind of seeps out and leaks out. So he got his tractor out, dug, a, dug the thing up, dug a big hole up. You know, we got uh, Debbie and Lauren out there, and he got some black plastic with betonite on it, to, you know, and, and uh, we're trying to figure out just what he's trying to do. Because I had an idea, but, you know, I thought, well, where in the heck, why is he digging there, you know? And, uh, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about perspective, but I'm telling you, Laura and I were sitting there, and Deb was trying to figure out what is the old goat doing. Now, the old goat is my dad's nickname for, that was when we had CBs, you know. How many remember the CBs? <laughs> they're, back, they're with the A-tracks now <laughs> in heaven. But uh, the CBs, I guess they're still around, aren't they? And uh, uh, they're, uh, anyway, that was my dad's CB handle, was the old goat. My mom was the nanny. Uh, my, uh, my brother was the kid, and I think I was little Abner. Uh, that's because I borrowed, I got somebody's number 12 uh, army boots, and I wore them, I only wear a size 8. So they called me little Abner. Anyway, the old goat's in his tractor, and he's digging away, digging away, and we're watching him, you know. And uh, Lauren and I start talking about just, you know, how, and Deb, about how active Dad is, how, you know, and he's, he's just extremely keen. He fell the other day. He got off his tractor and was trying to stand on a 4 by 4 and it spun out, and he fell, and so he thinks he cracked his ribs again. And so he's a little sore, and yet he worked in his tractor all day, and it was just kind of incredible to watch him. He really is a man that, that understands earth and understands, and he can, he can, he could have fixed Sly Hill in three, three hours. <laughs> uh, no, I'm not kidding you. He went up to a contractor, and he says, how much is your D9 cat run per hour, or whatever else? And the guy's doing the county, and he said, well, here's my plan. If I could have taken your cat, I could have done this or that. And, and that general contractor that does that said, Daryl, that would have worked. And we would have had a temporary road all this, you know, all this summer instead of driving around. Anyway, we well, were just talking about, you know, 90 years old and still kicking. Well, and Lauren just said, you know, he's quite the guy. And he said, well, you got those same genes. And, and here, here I want to tell you something about perspective. I want to tell you something about what faith will do. I have, in my family, we have longevity. Grandpa lived to be 108. Grandma lived to be 104. Great-grandfather lived to be 96. All, his brothers, all grandpa's brothers lived to be in their 90s. We have longevity. But I'm telling you, there's something more powerful than having longevity in your history. And a lot of people say, you know, well, you don't have to worry about it, John. You'll live long. No, let, let me tell you something. You have the DNA from God in you. When you get born again, your blood comes from the Father. You have God's blood in you. Here's the thing. you got to believe it. Do you know even if you have longevity in your family, you can die early in life? Your belief system can cancel out the goodness of the longevity that's in your, in your lineage. But if you don't have longevity in your lineage, you don't need to die early. You can still live a long time because if you believe. It just seems like it's easier for people when they see evidence of their parents and grandparents living long that they're going to live long. But I'm telling you, it's not whether your parents live long or short. It's what you believe. What I'm telling you is Bible, what I'm telling you is truth, but what else I'm telling you is you know is science now. It's biology now. We understand that now. What you believe. And we were just talking about perspective. Now, perspective. Now, if, when I look at the church and I say, uh, where was Jerry Clement sitting? Well, you know, from my perspective, he's on the right. Lauren, where is Jerry sitting in, in your perspective? Now, how much difference is that perspective? It's absolutely opposite, isn't it? So if, if you walk up to Lauren and say, oh, uh, where is Jerry Clement? You know, I don't know him that well. Where was he sitting? And Lauren says, you know, I say he was on the right. And so you're looking at that side. You'll never get to meet Jerry Clement. You'll never know who he was. Simply because the perspective was different. 
Was it a lie? Was it wrong? No. It's all truth. It's all right. But if you're not looking from the same perspective as the person talking to you, you are a, not just a little bit off, you're 180 degrees off. And boy, in construction, that was one of the things that was always a struggle when they're trying to figure out what was wrong with the house, you know, or how to build something. Is, is it took sometimes, you know, 15, 20 minutes before, uh, like Cliff and I, when we were building, we, we laughed our heads off a lot of times. It would take us that long just to both of us to look at it the same way. Once we looked at it the same way, we could really figure things out. But boy, if we were looking at it contrary, then the more we talked, the more confused we got. And it's like, man, are you, have you got your thinking cap on at all today? I mean, you know, when you're talking, you know, when you're, com- you're conversing with somebody like this. So perspective, how, how important is perspective? It's absolutely critical that we see things. What's the next uh, slide? Acknowledgement activates power. This is so simple, but I can't help but say it over and over and over. The only way the power of God really gets, really is allowed to flow in your, your life is when you know it, knowledge is power, but then when you acknowledge it, when you start saying, it said, we looked up the scripture, let the redeemed of the Lord say, and everybody wants to say so, but I want you to hold your tongue on so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say not so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say, God is a good God. And His loving kindness is everlasting. That's what the redeemed should be saying. And the God that, that created this earth, and, the, and, and not only created, but if you want to say it, I, 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 I kind of feel the liberty to say, God is the rules that make up this earth. Now He is a personal God too. Sagan had it right. God is the rules that make up this world because it came out of him. But he is more than just the rules. He is a personal living God. But when you say God is a good God, you know what you're saying? You're saying all the rules that govern life are good. And when you see them as good you, and you see how seed time and harvest is good, when you see what you sow, uh, you'll reap is good, then all you got to do then, and it's a lot easier when you see it that way, to say, I want to get in harmony with that. I want to work with that. And so remember our flipping around of the room here. Uh, if you don't feel in your heart that sowing and reaping, if you don't, you know how many Christians, uh, let's bring up the one that really irritates people, money. You know, people, you know how many people leave churches because they talk too much about money? You know how many people don't want to hear about money in church? Do you know why? It's because like, it's just like if I'm looking this way and Lauren's looking the other direction and we're calling things left and right, it's absolutely opposite. If you don't believe that God is a good God, all the rules that he set up, then you think sowing and giving is ridiculous. It absolutely looks like you're just throwing your money away. It just looks like it's a form of getting your money. And like Bill said, there, is some who are, there are some who will manipulate, but we're not talking about people that are trying to get your money uh, you know, and, and give you a false promise. We're talking about a God that said, here's the way the system works, gentlemen and ladies. Here's the way it works. You plant that seed, and that thing will grow. You give it water, you give it air, and, you give, and it will produce. And boy, talk about production. We can talk about a hundredfold on planting one seed of corn, but talk about production. There's nobody on the earth today. Even Bill Gates, with all that he's done with Microsoft, does not come close to the production of one apple seed producing how many apples year after year. Not just, oh, me, as long as you take care of that thing, that thing will produce, 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 produce. God is a good God. His rules that he set up are good. They are for your benefit. They are to bless you. They are to prosper you. They are to increase you. They are to give you flavor. And creativity and difference, you're not to be the same. Man, we are not, kids, we are never be just like everybody else. Dear God, don't go to school and try to be like everybody else. I love you guys, because look at it. You're all weird. I mean, you're all different. In a good way. 
man, keep that. Don't ever, you know, you, see, you look at the chart and say, well, they got a, this good grade, they got that grade, they got a better grade than I did. They, they got the, they're taller than I am, they're shorter than I am, they're, they're stronger than I am. It doesn't matter because you don't want to be like this when you're meant to be like this. I mean, when you get happy, to re- when you realize that God's a good God and made you just the way that, that you ought to be, then you start getting in harmony with that and you start, and you, you start working with that. And when you start working with it, uh, it works. But you know, when, when, you think that, when you think that the rules are, are, are not for you, then you have this feeling that you should do something, but you don't want to. Has anybody ever read the Word of God and said, I should do that, but I don't want to? Have you got areas right now that you're saying, I should do that, but I don't want to? And when you say something like, I know what I should do, I just don't want to yet. I know I should forgive, I just don't want to. You know what you're saying? You are, because of your perspective, you are totally missing the whole thing that whatever God asks you to do is for your good. It's for you to prosper. It's for you to excel. It's for you to be free. It's for you to just fly off in glory. And it's not for your pain. I'm fully persuaded from talking to people that most people think that God enjoys your pain. That he actually thinks it's beneficial. There are, you know, I believed it for years. No pain, no gain. I said that for years. You know, I've stopped saying that. Do you know why I stopped saying that? Because I stopped looking from this point. I went back to that point and looked and I go, pain is stupid. There is no pain, gain in pain. That was somebody else's idea. And you've heard me say this, but you know, I thought, well, how, Pastor, I really do believe there's gain in pain. Well, you know why I disagree with you now? Because the writing of the scriptures, Paul wrote in Romans and said, abhor evil. Abhor evil. Turn away from it. It should be disgusting to you. It should just turn you upside down to, to, to look, you know, to, uh, to behold evil. And that word evil means pain. Thank God I abhor pain. I dislike pain. What do I like? I love gain. And when I get in harmony with God's laws, and therefore I get in harmony, let's put it this, when I get in harmony with God, because of the way He made things, then I will be successful. And this was God said all the way from the, from the first book. I mean, from the, the Old Testament, He said in Joshua, uh, if you meditate on these things day and night, you'll be careful to do them. And if you're careful to do them, guess what? You're going to prosper. Whenever you do what God said, whenever you line up with God's ways, you will prosper. Your body will prosper. Your mind will prosper. And he said, man, when you believe, when you believe that you're going to live a long life and a satisfied life. You know something? I'm not interested in just living a long life. In fact, I've been wrestling with this for a long time because, you know, I thought about, man, how long do I want to live? I don't know if I want to live. Man, if I live to be 110, there are very few of you are going to be my friend anymore. You're going to be in glory. Some of you are going to make it, but a lot of you ain't. And I got to start all over and make new friends. Over and over and over. And when I hit 80, I got to go find some new 30-year-olds to play racquetball because the guys I'm playing now will be 60 and they'll quit. Man, they're going to quit, I guarantee you. Most of the guys I'm playing now will quit before they're 60, they'll quit before they're 50. So that means I got to go find new young people and I got to persuade them, Travis, that playing an old guy is okay. Because, you know, at first they're going to say, I ain't going to play no 80-year-old. But then when they find out I can whip them, then they're going to say, i got to play that. I ain't going to let no 80-year-old beat me. So some of you guys got to start learning how to play racquetball so you can try to beat me. I'm telling you, perspective or your be- fundamental belief about life is everything. It controls everything. And even, like I said, science, science now are telling us this. So let's look at a few scriptures here, scriptures. 
Let me ask you a question. Are you willing? And don't answer this real quickly. Are you willing to change your point of view and your persuasion 180 degrees? Now, before, before you answer that real quickly, think about that. If you're willing to absolutely change your whole perspective, it means what you used to call right is now left. Now, when Bill and I and, and Toby rolled the Explorer back in 2000-whatever, two, something, we rolled that thing, it was upside down. The one thing I remember about it was I kept crawling in and out of the broken window trying to find my billfold and other things. And I'm telling you, one thing I remember about it was it is so mind-boggling when you get back in the vehicle and left is right and right is left. And up is down and down is up. And you'd think you could think through that real easy, but I remember it messed with me. It just, every time I crawled in that thing, it messed with me. And what I'm saying to you today is, are you willing to have up go down and left go right and try to refigure out everything? Unless you answer real quickly, oh yeah, let me just say something to you. What Jesus was, what Bill brought out this morning, when Jesus was talking to the people, it was hard. It wasn't like it was difficult for them to do. It was hard because their way of thinking was, see, you and I don't catch this as much, but what Jesus was telling to the Jews was absolutely 180 degrees off of what they've always believed. And it would be one thing for some lukewarm Gentile to believe it, but a Jew was solid. A Pharisee was solid. A Pharisee knew what he believed, why he believed it. He studied it forever. He, was, he, was, he knew he's an expert. He was, not, he was not an amateur. He was a professional. He had been there. He had all that confidence. And Jesus was asking these Pharisees to absolutely flip upside down everything they'd ever thought believed about God you and I don't catch that because we weren't at that culture that time and the simple things that Jesus said that just absolutely make sense to us and some of these things well man, stupid disciples how dumb can you be if we could understand where they had been for all this time, how passionate they had been for what they had been believing, that their Messiah was coming as a ruler and a king to put down the Roman Empire and to, and to, to take control of this physical earth, and they were believing, and then Jesus coming along and says, it has nothing, the Messiah has nothing to do with defeating governments. It has everything to do, to do with taking control of your heart. And it was just like a flip over, and they, couldn't, they just couldn't find themselves. You know, I was just watching these guys that go down in these caves to fill them up, and they said when you find water in a cave, the real dangerous part is you can a lot of times see, and it looks like it's only a foot deep, and it may be 20 feet deep because it's so clear it hasn't been touched. But they said if you, you know, kids get into them sometimes, and they almost always drown. Why? Because the moment you get into it, it just becomes cloudy with all that silt. It just becomes mud and dark, and you can't tell which is up and which is down. They said the only way you can tell which is up is to feel the bubbles going up your cheek and figure out which way they're going and go up, you know. Now, how, t let me ask you something. If you step into what you think is a foot deep of water, and you go down 20 feet, or you go deep into it, and all of a sudden it turns muddy, and you can't see anything, how much control are you going to have to sit there? Now, feel the bubbles, John. Feel the bubbles. <laughs> Which way are they going? Go with the bubbles. <laughs> no, you're going to panic and just start going like as hard as you can, making it worse. And it's the same thing. When God actually starts speaking to you about changing your heart, you actually, if man, you can panic and just start beating the ground, beating everything around you because it is hard to figure out what is up and what is down, what is left and what is right. If you have your Bibles, turn to Isaiah 30, 15. I'm going to ask this a simple question. You know, Jesus did it, I'm going to do it. But do you really want life and life abundant or do you just want to get through? Do you really want life and life, all that God has for you, or do you just want to exist? Because if you want life and life abundant, you cannot go with the flow.
Isaiah 30, 15. For thus says the Lord God, Holy One of Israel has said, In repentance and rest you shall be saved. In quietness and trust is your strength. But you were not willing. From the time you and I are born, we, we, we start developing a sense of self-preservation. A baby starts developing. At first, they really trust their mom and, and mom and dad because they have nothing else to go, do. But as a young child, you start developing yourself, your, your sense of self-preservation. And with that, you begin, to begin, you, you begin to develop defense mechanisms that keep you alive. You learn if somebody's beating up on you, you learn to run, or you learn to fight back, or you, you, know, you learn to be aware of those things. You learn, how to, you learn how to survive. And by the time we get to adult age, we're, we're pretty well protected. We already have a, a, a perspective of what keeps us safe and how we're going to protect our life, and, and nobody's going, you know, both physically and emotionally and everything else. We don't let t- people get too close to us, all these kind of things. And, and the Jews definitely were trying to hold on to their place as, uh, as a political power, And when Jesus came along, he says, you know, in peace and in quietness and in trust is how you're going to get saved. And and it was like, lay your guns down, lay all the weapons down, lay everything down, all the uh, self-preservation defense mechanism that you've learned, and just trust me. Now, if you have been trained, Brandon was just telling me this, you know, that uh, during the rally he went home and the kids, you know, were were in bed and, and he got home. What, what time you get home? Usually early in the morning, three in the morning. Shouldn't be telling us because somebody might know. But anyway, he got home and he so he put all his guns away and put all that stuff away and he went out to go sleep in the in the camper. And he said he heard voices. Now, when you're trained and and the rally is just it's pretty nice most of the time, right, Bram? But there's a few really crazy people. Okay, and when you're trained and doing all that, and they said, you know, how many of you ever got scared out there in the dark? Man, I do. And Brandon just said, you know, he walked out and all of a sudden he heard voices right by his camper, which shouldn't have been there at 3 in the morning. It's okay to have a baby crying in church, but it shouldn't be voices out there. And he said, and all of a sudden he reaches for his gun and it's gone. Now see, you and I, some of us, not all of us, but a lot of us don't have carry guns all the time. Some of you guys do, I know. You know, you keep it up. Uh, get, keep your gun permits to do it. But... Uh, you know, for some of us, we wouldn't reach for that. We just reach for our cell phone, run and cry, and whatever else. But for Brandon, he was used to that, and so without having that, he was, you know, and being being trained and being in that atmosphere, you know, he had to start thinking, what am I going to do to defend myself? I think he did have your taser in your car, so he went to the car and got his taser. Just found out it was a couple old drunks, okay, walking through the neighborhood. I told him he should have tased him anyway. Just, it just ought to be right. I mean, you know, if you're doing that kind of stuff, it just, you deserve it. All I'm saying is, each one of us has developed our system of how we protect ourselves in relationships, especially is what I want to talk about. And then all of a sudden, Jesus comes into our life and says, put all that down, lay all that down, put it away, put your gun down, put your defenses down, Put your self-preservation tactics down. Put your walls down. And in peace and rest and trust, you'll be delivered. I'm telling you, when you actually experience that to that degree, it is hard. He's saying, I will no longer use manipulation to guide my children. I will no longer use manipulation to control my husband, my, my wife. I will, never, I will not use the silent treatment. I will not use the yelling treatment. I will not use the raising of my voice. I will not use anything in that manner. I will not use my big stature. You think about how much we control people. And Jesus is saying to us, lay it all down. Open up. You know, one of the big things we all do is we just, we control 
we control our environment by not exposing our heart, not, not saying anything. And all of a sudden, God says, I want you to talk about this. Some of you guys are looking at me like, I think I'll keep my gun. I think I'll keep my tactics. Why? Because it is difficult to lay down everything that you've ever trusted in and used to keep yourself safe. Because the truth is, if you had not used that up to this point, you would have died. Folks, you and I would have, there's some situations we would have been terribly hurt and terribly crushed and died if we hadn't used force, violence, manipulation, control of the situation. And Jesus is now saying to you, I want you to enter the kingdom of God of peace and I want you to lay all that down. And in that, you will be saved. And I'm asking him one more, and he said, and, and in this Old Testament scripture says, and you are not willing. So I'm asking you, are you willing? Let's look at Luke 15. Somebody say, I want life. Abundantly. Luke 15, 7. It says, I tell you in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Have you ever read that and disliked it? I have, because I got, I got saved at an early age, so I thought I was one of the 99. I thought, gee, God, since the time I've been eight, I've been one of the 99. You get more joy out of some old drunk getting saved than you do me. I didn't know what to do with that scripture, so I just leave it alone. And I don't know what you might think about. Our perspective would probably be different on this. Mine has changed and probably change again. But I'm not seeing it that way anymore. I'm seeing, listen. He's not talking about those people that are really righteous. He's talking about those who see themselves right. The 99 people that see themselves right. They're hanging on to what they've grown up with. They're hanging on to their old belief system. They're hanging on to what they think has made them right. Their toughness, their, their, their good deeds, their all that. Though, there's, not, there's more rejoicing over one that comes to the realization of saying, Oh my gosh, everything I believed in is wrong. I need to repent. There's more rejoicing in heaven over that one than the 99 that says, No, we'll just carry on the way we've been carrying on. It's been working so good so far. And then Luke 24. Say this while I'm saying, say, ask yourself, am I willing? Luke 24, 46. And he said to them, Thus it is written that Christ should suffer and rise again from the dead on the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning with Jerusalem. Nathan, if you would go in my office, there's a uh, pump for balloons and uh, three balloons. Would you grab them for me? Repentance for forgiveness will be proclaimed, Jesus said. What does repentance mean? Change one's thinking. Here's another definition uh, Bible, uh, out of a Bible dictionary. It says, to think differently, to reconsider, to change one thing. Would you pump up the white one for me and then tie it off? Repentance is to think differently, to reconsider, to change one's thinking. And so Jesus said, when he, when he, he said this, and I, I died, uh, I, went to, I went down and paid a price, I rose up, and now, it's, now what's going to happen is this message is going to be proclaimed to everybody that there's repentance for sins, repentance for forgiveness. What is forgiveness? Forgiveness means release. Forgiveness means to send away. Letting go as if it had never been committed. Say this, letting go as if it had never been committed. That's what forgiveness means. 
And Jesus said, there's going to be a repentance for forgiveness. There's going to be what? A total change of thinking on how to be released from failure. Sin is failure. From failure and losing and, and uh, sending it away and letting it go as if it had never been committed. Thank you. Now, When Adam and Eve were first created, were they created perfect? As far as we know, as perfect as far, especially as far as the word perfect means complete. A snake came up and said, you're not perfect. And Eve was willing to repent. She was willing to totally change her thinking. She actually went from thinking that she was created in God's image and was perfect to thinking she was imperfect. And by that, by that change of thinking, something happened to her. Sin actually came. And Nathan, would you just, now look at this balloon. And, and, and I know there's a poor illustration. But this balloon, let's just say it's perfect for what it's supposed to be. Right? It's a perfect balloon for what it's supposed to be. It's white and it's perfect in shape. Right? Nope. No bumps. No acne, no moles. It's perfect. But all of a sudden, some came in, and Nathan, if you just push your finger onto that, into that balloon, and, and please don't pop it. I'd, it yet. But now it became imperfect. Eve opened up and changed her thinking about what she had been told from Adam, that they were created in the image of God, and all of a sudden she became imperfect. She's got... Bumps, put another finger on it. And as time went on, more things started happening. And so this thing got more and more twisted and more and, uh, and, and perverted. And it wasn't what it was supposed to be. What is the, fir- the original sin was what? Doubt? Mistrust? We could say it in a lot of different ways, but it means the same thing. Believe in a lie. She believed a lie. And what, what was the first attributes of the original sin? Fear. Fear and what else? Shame. Run and hide. Run and hide. Now, when you and I think about the sin nature, I had somebody ask me, well, what about the sin nature? What, what do we think about when we think about the sin nature? Rebellion. Co- being contrary. Get drunk. Find a woman. Smoke pot. Do you know, when Adam, got, when Adam sinned, I don't think he rolled up a reefer and said, dang, we've got to find me another woman. I'm going to go look the whole earth for another woman. <laughs> I don't think so. What he did, you know, what he did was he ran and hid, ran away from God, ran away from what? Here, you hold the balloon and you keep your finger poked in. He ran away from the principles that governed everything properly. He ran away from not only the presence of God, but he ran away from all that God had made and all the rules that he made that prospered him, that that caused him to live a good... He ran away from the law that says, you, Adam, will rule the earth. You, Adam, will take charge. He, instead of standing tall and taking charge, he ran away and hid. You and I look at sin with this perspective that it's just doing something wrong, you know... Doing something, you know, whatever wrong it is. And we think that's a sin nature. The sin nature is not going out and getting drunk and and committing adultery and all that. The sin nature is running away from what you were supposed to do, which is stand tall and be successful and be perfect. You bought into a lie that you weren't perfect. That's the sin. Now Jesus comes along and says, I have come to redeem man back and to put him back in a proper place, but I'll pay the price so he can do it. And what? He said, this gospel is going to be a gospel of repentance. What do most people think of when they hear of repentance? 
Oh, boo-hoo, I'm so sorry, God. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, I'm such a worm. I'm so unworthy. And they think they're going to get something out of that, and they do. They get this feeling that they did something good. And they start feeling better. I paid a price. I humiliated myself in front of the whole church. I acknowledged what a rat I was. And that's good, and I feel better for being good. And guess what? They're still in the same boat. Dead works. Their effort. And yet the church has honored that. Oh, they... And if they don't do that, we say something like, I don't think they really had a repentive heart. You know, I spanked Caden, and, and, and he just laughed. You've never done that, have you? Oh, son. Bless you, parents. Bless you. I had kids like that. And we say, oh, they don't have a repentive heart. Why? Because what you're thinking of, they need to be remorseful. How many of you believe that? How many of you believe that? And I'm asking you today, are you willing to change your total thinking? And up will be down and right will be left. Because that is not repentance that leads to life. So you can spank your child and they can laugh. Don't do that. But here's where repentance is when they change their thinking. And I found out that kids can sometimes laugh and change their thinking. You say, I don't need to do that anymore. And so parents, when your kids don't feel shame and guilt, rejoice. Because if they come in back in harmony, what Jesus was saying is come back into harmony. And guess what? Forgiveness is when, when, poke your finger in there pretty good. Forgiveness is when you say, I release you. I send you away. And so I send you away. And guess what happens automatically? Huh? You're perfect. You're perfect. You're perfect again. Do you know what most of us, most of our perspective is? Most of us see ourselves as this twisted old balloon that says, someday if I can, and I should have brought one, I don't think I got anything, but if I brought a bucket up here and used it for an illustration or a metal ball and we just pounded the daylights out of that metal ball, you know, or that bucket and dented it all up, and then, uh, then we said, okay, now this is our life, all dented up, all screwed up, unrighteous. Unrighteous means what? Not the way it should be. So we're all, we're not the way we should be. We're not the way we should be. So we go say, well, I'm going to crawl inside that balloon and I'm going to push that thing out. And then we push it in from the outside and it actually comes out the other way. And we take a bucket and you try to take a bucket that's all dinged up and unless you're a really good body man, and even then you use filler, you can't get that metal back to where it was. Can you? I mean... You can tap, 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 and try to do all you want to. But usually, Jerry, the last finishing touches on a vehicle that's been damaged have to have filler in there. It's not perfect. And we think about our life as that way, as a messed up, screwed up life that we're trying to push back and to get right. We're trying to be right. We're trying to get ourselves right. We're trying to get, we're, we're trying to, we're trying to get the right attitudes. We're trying to get all the right attributes. We're trying, we, we were a sinner and trying to get righteous. But the truth of the matter is we were righteous and something came from the outside and poked in and made us not the way we should be. And Jesus came along and said, now I give you power. I give you power. I give you power to change your thinking about forgiveness. And when you understand that I have empowered you through this knowledge, then you are the one that just says, I release you. I send you away. And when you send it all away, guess what's left? You perfect. Now, I don't know if this makes a lot of sense to you right here. I hope so. But I'm telling you, the difference 
is 180 degrees if you're trying to get perfect or if you know you're perfect and you're just sending away the flaw. I'm just sending away the flaw. I'm just saying, go away. Go away. <laughs> Thank you, Nate. Forgiveness. Letting them go as if it had never been committed. Do you know one thing about that balloon is it doesn't show where the fingers have been. It doesn't show, it has, it has no evidence that there was ever a finger mess, you know, messing it up. And you're quiet and I appreciate that. Acts 26, 20 says, by the way, when you, when you, do, when you do get forgiven and you do get this repentance, bear the fruit that goes along with repentance. You know, when you really believe this, guess what? There will be fruit. Made you nervous. Me too. When you really believe this, people say, well, you know, you're just giving us a license to do whatever we want to and call ourselves perfect. Yes, I am. But there's a certain fruit that comes when you really believe this. It's called deeds of righteousness. When you actually believe it, you will be kind. When you actually believe it, you will be patient. When you actually believe this, you do become righteous the way it ought to be. You don't struggle anymore to forgive. You don't struggle anymore uh, to be kind. You are. What you are. Oh, man, I've been waiting to do that. I'm telling you, there's something different about a carrot grown in real dirt than one grown in the store. <laughs> Probably a sermon there, but you ever heard of this scripture? Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And people say, I remember that was a sermon I was preached when I was a kid. And the guy said, you better understand what perfect means before you try to do that, but you need to find it. But you better, you better understand, God said, be, you per be ye perfect as I am perfect. Don't just wash it off and say, you can't do it. As Bill said, you know, that scripture, hey, these things are hard to understand. They're hard to understand. If you're in the back, <coughs> oh, wow. <coughs> if you're in the back and Jerry Clement's on the left and you're looking from up here and he's on the right, it's hard. It's hard to understand. If you're looking from the wrong perspective, you haven't changed your thinking yet, it's hard. But he said, be perfect, I am perfect. It's not hard at all when you see this, is it? You were created perfect. From the get-go, you were perfect. Something came along and twisted you. Send it away. Forgive yourself. Forgive them. Release it. And act like it never... What, you know, I say act, but that's not really... Believe. Why? Because knowledge is power. And acknowledgement... Acknowledgement activates the power. When you start saying, I am free... I have forgiven them. It's as if they never did it. Isn't that what Jesus said? It's as if they never did Why? And then all of a sudden, bam, you're just perfect again. And guess what? In this state, you don't need the weapons of manipulation, fear, control, because now you really are powerful. Jesus was in this state, you know, and they tried to kill him. You know what he did? He walked through them. Had an angry mob go and throw him over a cliff. And I don't know if you've ever seen an angry Jew, but it's pretty close to a Dutchman. And, and they were mad, and they were, and, and, and see, he didn't have to shout, he didn't have to do anything. He just, Brandon, he was perfect, he had power. And he just walked away. He just walked through the crowd. It doesn't say how he did it, he, did, he just did it. Do you know, when you get to the state, You can do the same thing. Yeah, but look what they end up doing to Jesus. No, 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 no. 
they didn't do it to Jesus. He said, no one takes my life. I pick it up when my father tells me and I lay it down. And when my father tells me to lay it down, I'll lay it down. And what he did was he laid it down. Nobody took him, Jerry. Pilate even said, I can save you from this. And, he, and Jesus said, you can't save me from this. Because my father's asked me to do this, so I'm going. But even in my going, I'm free. Even in my going, I will prosper. I will do it because of all my family that I'm going to get. He was looking to the reward. Would you stand with me, please? How many of you are willing? Anybody want to be willing? You say, well, I got born again. I know, but listen, just being born again doesn't mean that you've changed all your thinking, does it? The Bible says that from that point on, you must renew your mind, change your thinking daily. Glory to God. Romans 8 talks about, hey, if God be for us, who can be against us? If God be for us, who can be against us? If all the rules that God has created are for us, who can be against us? If all the rules that God created for your body to be healthy uh, are intact, what cancer can be against you? When you start seeing this from a different perspective, everything, I'm telling you, everything changes. Left is right and right is right and up and down and sideways. It's all changes. Why? Because all of a sudden you see, if he didn't withhold Jesus, he won't withhold one good thing. That means every law that he's put in place is for my benefit. Let the redeemed of the Lord say, God is good. That means every rule he's got is good. Everything he said to do is good. Everything about sowing and reaping is good. And see, some of us, all we know is if we sow, you know, sow to destruction, we'll die in destruction. That's our whole perspective is, oh, yeah, if I go get drunk, I'm going to get in trouble. If I go do this, I'm going to get in trouble. And, we, and we, we miss the whole point. No, he put all that in place to bear good fruit. Can it be twisted? Yes. Are you twisted? No. If you believe. If you believe. No wonder Jesus said, only believe. Only believe. Only believe that you're perfect. Now, if, you got, if you're willing to change, say this with me. I am what I am. I'm perfect. Say it one more time, I'm perfect. How many of you are struggling with that and you're thinking, well, I know a few flaws. Anybody? There's a few hands going up. Good. Okay. I'm not denying that. But instead of some twisted thing that's trying to get right, just see yourself, I'm perfect. That's got a little bit of a twist going on. But all I got to do is hear the gospel that the twist is no longer powerful in my life. I need to acknowledge, and I need to send it away. Can I just tell you on a personal note, there's a few attitudes in me that I knew weren't in harmony with God. And about two and a half months ago, I did an experiment on one of them. I'm driving to town, which is a very long drive right now. <laughs> so I was making the most of it. And about halfway through that drive, I said this, very committed, very hard. I said, I am bringing down this attitude that I have of what I think I need and what I want, and I'm lowering the significance of it. I'm bringing the significance down on it. I just said that out loud in my car. I'm turning down the significance of a, of a you know, there, there are, th are there things that you kind of like and want and want in certain ways, and if you don't get them, you're a little bit irritated? I was one of those things. And I'm telling you, Jerry, after two and a half months, it floors me. I, I, I've been experimenting with this. I didn't try hard after that point. I didn't even try to be good at that point anymore. I'm telling you, all I can tell you, after two and a half months right now, that significance is so low that I don't give a rip about it, and it disturbs me a little bit. It's like, what's happened to me? I don't even care. It isn't what used to be an irritation and what used to really torque me off and bother me. Something must be wrong with me. I don't care. It's okay. I'm at peace. I'm telling you, I didn't make any effort. And I'd made a lot of effort before. 
I mean, and I just said, say it again, I'm perfect. And I choose, say it again, I choose to release, to send away every offense, every hurt, every pain, every fear, every doubt. I send it away. I release it as if it never happened. Father God, I thank you for that. Right now, all over this building, all over this room, there are individual people that are truly repenting, that are truly changing their viewpoint and the way they're thinking. And all of heaven, all of heaven is rejoicing over those that I finally realized came into this knowledge that they don't have to become perfect. They are perfect. They don't have to work at it. They just need to believe. And all of heaven, I want you to just, last few moments here, can you, can you see it? Can you use your imagination and can you see Can you see heaven getting crazy? Can you hear the angels singing? Can you hear a few angels dancing? Can you see some doing spirals with their wings up into the air? Can you see a big angel coming down at a nosedive and all of a sudden, shoom, pulling up right at the right time saying, They did it! They believed! This is all of heaven rejoices. The angels rejoice. When one person changes their whole way of thinking and from the original sin of believing a lie that they were not perfect, they repent back and say, I am perfect. God is a good God. He made me good. He made me good. I no longer believe the lie. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, some of you right now need to just step over that line and just begin to declare out of your mouth, therefore, I understand that I'm healthy. Something's poking me, trying to get me twisted, but I'm releasing it and sending it away. I am healthy. Some of you need to just start saying, I am wealthy. I've been poked, and and it appears that, that things are not working right, but that's just an appearance. I send it away. I'm not going to try to be wealthy. I declare out of my mouth the truth. I am wealthy. I am a success. I am strong. I am perfect. Glory to God. This is why I said unto you, only believe. This is why I said unto you, have trust in God. Trust in the truth, the foundational truths that I set in order at the foundations of the earth. That when they had been twisted, I sent my son and untwisted them and set them back in the way they ought to be. If you only believe, you will say unto the mountain, get up and go, and it will obey you. Speak. 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 And it will obey you. This is is the way I meant for it to be. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Just got a few seconds here. I really encourage you. You can say it in your heart, but you can say it just muttered. Nobody needs to hear you, but just start saying some things. Start speaking some things right here, right now. Step across the line right now. Bear some fruit according to the repentance of the change of the thinking and begin to just say, I am perfect. Some of you, some of you wives need to say, I am perfect. 
I'm the perfect spouse. Hallelujah. 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 I, I'm not trying to labor this thing, but there's people right here really so close, so close, almost persuaded, almost persuaded. And yet, you know what's holding it back? Fear. Fear. Fear of what if. Mistrust. What if it doesn't? And I'm saying, this is where it takes courage. Step across the line. I'm going to help you. I'm going to lead you one more time. I want everybody to say it. Just, you know, say it firm and say it loud. Say it with me. I am, I am. what the Word says. The word says. I, am I am totally forgiven. Totally. Which means I'm perfect. I'm, perfect. I'm, in control. I'm in control. In peace and in quietness. I am saved. I am delivered. I'm set free. Joy is filling my heart. Confidence is who I am. I am perfect. A perfect child of God. Hallelujah. Give at least five people a high five and have a great week. <laughs>